Well, welcome and thank you everybody for attending this session. Here we are late in the afternoon, right after a powerful uh, pot-infused uh, <laughs> keynote from the governor I heard. I didn't see all of it, but I heard some really cool details about it. Uh, and I'm all for that plan, just for the record. Um, I'd like to thank you because we're sandwiched here uh, right between that keynote and we're standing between you and a great uh, craft Michigan beer at uh, uh, hidden gem establishments like the Pink Pony and the uh, Mustang Lounge here on the island. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Joe Sawaski. I'm the president and CEO of Merit Network in Michigan. And Merit is really another hit, hidden gem that you probably haven't heard of. We don't have a lot of name recognition. But I'd like to tell you, we're one of the oldest uh, technology organizations in the state of Michigan. We were formed in uh, 1966 as a spinoff from the University Research Corridor uh, set of institutions. I see some URC representatives in the audience here today. Hi, Brittany. Thanks for coming. Um, in 1966, these scientists had a wild idea that they should share files between standalone computers on a data network. And those things really didn't exist back in 1966. So it was a pretty novel idea. As you fast forward into the uh, future in 1987, uh, some of you may not know that Michigan and Merit Network uh, played a really important role in the history of the internet. Uh, Merit ran for the entire country this thing called the National Science Foundation Network. It was a research network that connected most of the research uh, universities together in the United States. That little thing that was called the NSFNet uh, transformed into something you may have heard of. It's called the Global Internet. So Michigan actually had a really storied place in the development of that. And uh, apparently we were right there at the beginning with Al Gore and his very uh, capable team. So we had a really good company. That's an internet joke if uh, you're not a, a techie. So <laughs> you'll elicit a little laughter here. Um, if you move into the future now, uh, Merit serves about 400 or other organizations. We serve uh, mainly nonprofit organizations in the state of Michigan. We provide advanced network services to all the public universities in Michigan, uh, most community colleges, and all of K through 12, one way or another, in libraries and some hospitals. So we've got a pretty far-reaching network, 4,000 miles of infrastructure, which is unique for a nonprofit. And we're the first to RE network in the United States as well. Um, our panel today, as you've heard, is uh, Fix the Damn Internet for Michigan Students. We're trying to riff off of uh, uh, the governor's office, really cool fix the damn roads uh, hashtag. We're getting a little bit of traction uh, on that. So thank you for letting us borrow that idea, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. Um, appreciate your support on that. Um, this, this issue is really a, uh, an issue of digital inclusion and digital equity, and I'd characterize it as a crisis in Michigan. Uh, I'm going to unveil some statistics later uh, as we get deeper into the panel about the extent of the problem in Michigan. But uh, it's also described as a homework gap. And if we have educators in the audience, I'm sure you've heard of this uh, situation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the homework gap is uh, basically where a large uh, portion of students that have a lot of internet access whether, when they're at school go home in the evenings with an expectation from their teachers and their fellow students that they complete uh, assignments uh, at home in their residences, you know, doing homework, uh, using online learning resources, and the sad fact is a large proportion of students in the United States and, and even a larger proportion here in Michigan don't have what the FCC ca uh, classifies as standard broadband uh, internet infrastructure in their homes. And it's a real crisis. And this whole thread of the uh, education crisis that's being uh, woven throughout the theme, uh, this is not helping that, right? When you have a high proportion of students going home without the tools to do their work, uh, it can be very, very frustrating. So. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a moment. I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves, and I'd like to start with the Lieutenant Governor. <clears throat> well, thank you, Joe. Uh, this is a very important conversation. My name is Garland Gilchrist II. I'm proud to serve as the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Michigan. And you hear Governor Whitmer and I, as we uh, travel across the state, talking a lot about infrastructure. And when many people think of infrastructure, yes, they think of roads, they think of bridges, they think of water infrastructure. We also are thinking about the kind of connective infrastructure that can connect our communities. And broadband internet connectivity is what I think uh, I would characterize as the most enabling infrastructure that we can create and invest in in the state of Michigan and really, frankly, anywhere. The experience of being connected to the internet creates opportunity and possibility for people that really is difficult to predict how they can use it to take their lives and their experiences to the next level. I've seen this personally, uh, so I'm, I'm from the city of Detroit, and my first job uh, was where I actually built a set of computers and installed them in a rec center on the west side of Detroit, and then uh, taught a computer class, sort of a training class, 
for people who were going to that rec center for different services to be able to learn how to use these computers. And by far the most meaningful experience, even more meaningful than showing a senior citizen how to use the mouse by playing solitaire on Windows, was showing this little girl named April the internet for the first time. And the, the moment that really clicked her and I saw lit up her imagination was when she, we, her and I were, this is 1998, so we were using Alta Vista as a search engine, and we searched for the word tiger. And the first two things that came up in terms of the results were the Detroit Tigers, which is great, and Bengal Tigers in India. And she saw this tiger, it was in the wild, and she recognized that that tiger was not at the Detroit Zoo, and said, wait a minute, that's, that's like on the other side of the world, right? That's in India. And I said, absolutely, that is in India. And her eyes just lit up, and she knew that she was looking at something that she couldn't physically touch, but that she could experience through this thing called the internet. That's an experience that every child in Michigan deserves, and that every household in Michigan must have access to in order for us to create the conditions for success no matter where you live in the state of Michigan. So this question of connectivity and how we bridge these gaps of access to the internet, whether it is from an infrastructure and build out perspective for places where the infrastructure may not yet exist physically, or whether it is the question of affordability to where we can help people get across that finish line to be able to truly experience the internet in their homes, or where it's the question of digital literacy, where if you have it, have access to the infrastructure, if you can afford it, but now how are you using it to, the, to its fullest and best potential, both for entertainment and education, both for healthcare, and to make sure that yes, you can actually do better on your homework when you have access to this amazing and enabling resource. So that's the perspective that we take on it from the state level. We are excited to be working with a number of partners across the state to have this conversation about what connectivity does look like, what is the reality of connectivity in the state of Michigan, and how can we create pathways for more people to experience it. There is energy toward higher connectivity, particularly in rural communities, coming down from the federal level. Um, when I spent some time in Washington, D.C. In, uh, in March of this year, uh, one of the more fruitful conversations I had with members of the Trump administration was about supportive programs for uh, rural broadband connectivity through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, these are opportunities that our administration wants to support Michigan companies, Michigan nonprofits, Michigan educational institutions coming together and partnering to go after these federally available dollars in the, in the form of grants, matching funds, or loans to be able to build out this infrastructure and build out what it takes to actually connect our people to the internet. Because I am confident that if Michigan's communities are better connected, if Michigan's children are better connected, that our state will be better for it. So this is not a, a high priority for our administration in this infrastructure conversation, and we're glad to be here participating in this today. Well, those are powerful opening remarks, and I'd like to commend you, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. When I emailed your office uh, early in your administration, you got back to me that day and said, how can we help? And uh, I think it just shows that uh, it's an action-ready action, uh, uh, administration, so thank you for that. So, Johannes? <coughs> Thank you, Cho. I'm currently uh, here in two roles uh, as a chair of the Department of Media and Information. I try to help students get um, cutting edge skills, how to use information communication technologies in the future lives. As the chair of the Quello Center, I'm conducting research, helping people in practice, businesses, uh, uh, policymakers, nonprofit institutions to find workable solutions to big challenges. I actually didn't grow up in Michigan. Uh, I grew up in Austria, and I actually, like, unlike one of my, my colleagues, I don't have any ambitions to become the governor of Michigan. <laughs> uh, but I came to this country actually about 30 years ago, 28 years ago, because I wanted to understand better what the factors were for, that had led to such an outstanding telecommunications infrastructure. The place I lived at at this point, Austria was actually lousy. Service was, was very expensive was not available in many areas, and the United States looked really great. I came here to, to learn this, and I stayed. I became a U.S. citizen. I, I still, I'm still in love with this country. <coughs> but I'm saddened by the fact that the United States has actually fallen backwards internationally. The country that I came from now, in many statistics, does better than the United States. And the United States 
which was leading at the time I came here, is now doing worse than many of its peer countries. And, but the interesting story that is embedded in this information is not that the U.S. is falling back, but the U.S. is actually outstanding in some areas. Those who get top quality service get much better service than, than in most other places in the world. But the gap between those who have great service and those who have very poor service has actually increased. So on average, across the entire country, the US has slipped back in, in many statistics. There's one exception to this, and that is wireless broadband connectivity, but, where the US continues to be number four uh, in, the, in the comparison with the OECD countries. But in fixed broadband, we are number 24. Uh, in, in, in other areas, we're number 17. And I think it's this gap between the best served and the poorest served that really has widened in the past 20 years and that needs to improve the newest. I'm actually not surprised that this happens. It's, it's really how markets and how private entrepreneurship works. That's what one would ex expect because as an entrepreneur, you go to areas where there's purchasing power, where there's high income. But what has ap apparently happened is that the, that the policies that were in place before to make sure that those who are disadvantaged are also brought up uh, to the level of others have not been as effective in the last two decades than they were in the past. And I hope that we can find solutions today. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Hudson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rocket Fiber. We're a high-speed fiber optic internet service provider headquartered in Detroit. Uh, we're part of the Quicken Loans Rock uh, Venture family of companies, and we've been around for about five years now. Um, so my, my part in this conversation is we've been building internet infrastructure in Detroit, um, which has one of the largest digital divides of any major American city in the country. Um, so this is a very, very relevant uh, topic in, in uh, conversation today for us and has been since our formation. A um, couple fun facts here along the way that we've done a lot of work with Merit since our early days uh, building fiber down Woodward Avenue. Um, Johannes was actually one of my professors at Michigan State. Uh, I won't tell you when because I don't want to. I don't want to date either of us. Um, and the lieutenant governor has been a close friend and ally in the in the fight against the digital digital divide, uh, going back to his time as the deputy CIO at the city of Detroit. And we've had many conversations on this topic. Um, and really, for me, this this topic is about the internet being the greatest tool to bridge the inequality gap that has ever existed in human history. Um, and now we have a whole uh, uh, very at-risk part of our population that's being left behind, and those are kids. And that's what we're here to talk about today, so, so happy to be here. Great, thank you very much. And I really wanna thank the panel. This is a real powerhouse, and we're lucky to have you all here today. So um, if we uh, fast forward here. Uh, we believe this uh, panel topic is really very aligned with the Mackinac Policy Conference theme of uh, uniting the state as one Michigan. Uh, you can't unite a state, nor prepare a state, nor grow a state if you don't have basic communication infrastructure to uh, bind a population together. Uh, as Mark says, uh, we, be we believe the uh, internet is really the great equalizer, and right now it's unequal, uh, you know, unequally applied, unfortunately, and that is the sort of the crux of the problem here today. Um, if I can unveil a statistic here, this is from the Michigan's uh, first broadband roadmap report that was ever created, and it was uh, uh, developed uh, in sort of the waning months of the Snyder administration last year. Um, it was a lot of work that was done under the auspices of the Michigan 21st Century Infrastructure Commission. I know some of us on this panel were uh, privileged to uh, be on the working group for that. Um, it may surprise you to know that there are over 360,000 homes without the lowest level of FCC defined standard broadband internet service in their homes, and that's an incredible number, and it's kind of startling. Um, and the real bottom line is 27% of K through 12 students in this state do not have access to broadband internet service in their homes, where there is an expectation to complete homework assignments and, and achieve academically. And you can see some other statistics there that basically say that uh, students themselves know that this hinders their academic uh, performance, but. I thought it might be more powerful to actually have you hear from students themselves and teachers and administrators. So uh, we opened up with some storytelling uh, from the Lieutenant Governor, which is always a powerful thing. And we actually did this video over the last four weeks, so this isn't dated, and it was ju done just north of, uh, north of the bridge. And this is just one example, although this problem exists in many different locales across the state. So let's listen to what the students and teachers have to say. I have no 
access to internet. There's a lot of times where your browser will crash. We'll still get that perpetual spin and we'll have to wait for it to reload. I miss out on a lot of schoolwork with it. And it does get really frustrating. It will load eventually, just will probably take like 15 minutes just to load one page though. I turn on my computer and then I'll go get dinner. And then by the time I'm done with dinner, my computer's loaded and I can log in. Let's say the YouTube video is like five minutes. That'll take out our Wi-Fi for like three days. We have to make sure that all students, whether they're located in a city or in the country, more rural areas, have the same opportunities to learn that many of their counterparts in other states have. You guys are in the 21st century and I'm still stuck back in the 20th. It's kind of a curve and it's not really fair to us. There's a lot of issues at play, our climate, our rural nature, and also internet access. It takes like 30 minutes average for a police or a sheriff's van to get up here. So we're very isolated. I couldn't come into town because the roads were so dangerous. My grade definitely suffered. If you don't have the internet to do it, then you've got to stay after school. And if you're in a sport, you might not be able to do that. If they don't have a computer, they can check a computer out. But do they have the access outside at home to be able to connect? I can't do it at home, so I have to do it in this hour. And it's just frustrating. It's like we've bought a brand new vehicle for every kid to access whatever it is that they need to access to be successful. We just don't have gas to put it in there. We don't have access to the internet. So it keeps all the vehicles parked here. As long as we're keeping our young people here, our families here, that's going to be success for Michigan. And broadband connections, that high-speed internet connection is key to making that happen. Until we get that, there's still going to be a majority of kids who are behind the learning curve of everybody else. That's what the legislators need to hear. Either every student in Michigan counts or none of them count. You can't leave some out and say you care about kids. Everyone counts or nobody counts. Well, that's a pretty, uh, pretty moving set of stories. And again, I thought it would be very relevant to uh, hear from students who are right around us on both sides of the bridge. So uh, these problems do exist in every area uh, of Michigan, though, even urban areas, and the causes are different. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, bottom line is the federal government uh, realizes this problem exists, and this is a bipartisan issue, it really is. Uh, and there are billions of dollars at stake in uh, you know, the way of federal subsidies, grants, and loans to actually fix the problem. And we'll talk a little bit about measurement and, and how those dollars need to be applied uh, more equitably and more accurately uh, in the state. So the good news is bipartisan issue. Uh, state of Michigan knows the problem exists. Uh, in last year's Michigan Broadband Roadmap Report, um, it was described and estimated that uh, Michigan ranks 30th in broadband adoption to homes, even though we're a top 10 state economically and from a population perspective. Something's really out of skew there. And finally, the, the kind of the really scary thing is uh, the problem is most likely bigger than the federal government uh, uh, is estimated. Um, their numbers say that 25 million individuals don't have access to broadband services in the United States. Microsoft just this year released a report that says, from their estimate, from what they can see with all their tools and their, their cloud applications, it's more like 160 million uh, people are not served by what the FCC calls you know, uh, standard broadband services. So there's really no question the problem exists. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to move into the panel discussion now. And we've got a number of questions that we sort of cast in a, you know, the past, the present, and the future. So we're gonna start a little bit with the past and kind of near-term conditions. So we've had the internet for a long time and the World Wide Web, which is kind of the civilian interface to the internet since the early to mid-90s. Um, and we've had decades of innovation and construction and literally hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure build, billions of which occurred in Michigan. Yet here we are today with 27% of students still without basic access in their homes. It's a real tragedy. So we talked a little bit about rural, but uh, Lieutenant Governor, in urban areas like uh, Detroit and Flint, um, 
lots of ISPs in those areas, dense populations that should attract uh, you know, uh, business models and returns that are sufficient for those organizations, yet we still have this problem. Uh, what is the impact to students in those areas, in those communities, and even the state uh, at large? So the, one of the core premises or motivations for the creation of the internet was this notion of being able to share information and create community. It was to do the opposite of isolating people. And one of the things that people and children experience when they are not able to be connected in, in, at home in a context in which they're comfortable is that they are isolated in many respects. You know, the homework gap really is a problem of isolation. I cannot connect to be able to have the tools I need to do the learning that I want to do or that I'm required to do um, to move forward. They're isolated from the social interactions that can happen online that can be uh, well, you know, both healthy and not so healthy, but they're isolated from people. And um, that's something that we don't want people to miss out on. In the city of Detroit, uh, as Mark alluded to earlier, um, you know, statistics have shown that we have sort of the deepest challenges when it comes to uh, access. And that may not be so much a question of physical infrastructure in a place like Detroit or in a city like Flint or in Saginaw or in Grand Rapids. That gets at the question the, of the other two sort of pillars of that stool that I referred to uh, earlier when we're talking about affordability. When there's been some strides made um, by some companies, I know that Comcast, for example, has stepped up and extended the reach of their Internet Essentials program to be available to people who live in HUD-assisted housing, to be available to households that have free and reduced lunch. And I think that's what those are important first steps. But the statistics still show that there is more work to be done. And so one of the, the things that we would like to do is continue to work with providers of all types to ensure that we are being aggressive in dealing with this affordability problem, that we are dealing with this challenge and saying that what more can we do? Because frankly, the people who have um, affordable internet access today, low cost or at no cost, which are really some solutions we should be thinking about, they will pay for the internet in the future. That is not a question. If we are enabling the opportunity for them to have the educational experiences that they need, that they, that they need and deserve to have access to, that will lead to them building um, healthy and productive adult lives in which they will happily be internet full paying customers. So we need to invest and make those investments in people and children in our futures today in order to make this, um, make this, access, and this access real. The fact that that has not happened in an equitable fashion um, is a problem that Michigan can solve. And I think that um, you know, we're ready to work with incumbent partners, ready to work with the partners that have not been developed yet. There are partnerships to be created. Um, and solutions to be thought of to address this challenge. And if we do so, then we can dive into this last pillar of the soul, which is on digital literacy. How can we be creative while having people truly understand and experience the potential that the internet offers them? I, I think that's really what we're working with. Thank you. And I, I uh, should have reminded the audience that we're gonna try to reserve 10 minutes at the end for questions too, so there's some blue question cards and it's kind of a standard protocol in these things, but I was supposed to mention that and I forgot, so I'm sorry. Uh, so that's very insightful about the urban areas and the different kinds of challenges that cause these problems. And Mark, your, your organization, Rocket Fiber, has taken on your own Detroit Moonshot program, and I copied your name, by the way, for the Michigan Moonshot. So, I love it. So, with attribution, so, so sorry about that. Good ideas, right, uh, emulation? We'll, we'll talk Rose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you're on the ground doing this work in an urban area. You know, what does it look like there, and why do you think, from a service provider perspective, these problems exist? Well, I think the lieutenant governor hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's, it's, common, it's a common misperception that it, it's purely an access problem when it's not. We know that you know, in the city of Detroit, most households have uh, access to at least one uh, and usually two service providers, in some cases three. Um, so when Rocket Fiber, when we started and we knew this issue was pervasive throughout the city of Detroit, we wanted to really understand it. We wanted to not assume that we had the, the end solution. We were gonna build fiber all over the city, everyone was gonna you know, rejoice and, and buy high-speed gigabit internet. Um, so we actually partnered with the, the Quello Center um, to do a study of the digital divide in Detroit. And what we found uh, reinforced some of the, the public data that was out there that anywhere between 30 to 40% of households in the city of Detroit don't have a fixed line broadband subscription, meaning they don't have a current subscription to DSL or cable internet or fiber internet. What we found in that subset of households that didn't have the fixed connection, many of them were mobile. Uh, in fact, they were mobile only. Um, but unfortunately, mobile is not the same experience as having a ubiquitous in-home Wi-Fi coverage 
uh, to connect to other devices like laptops and tablets. So when we talk about at-risk population like, like uh, kids who need to do homework at home, really hard to do that on your phone. Um, and then going even deeper, we found that a lot of the, the mobile-only families or households were prepaid data plans. So they actually, at the end of the month, uh, often would run out of data. And the choice at that point is, am I putting food on the table or am I buying an internet subscription? And uh, the obvious, chances, uh, obvious answer is I'm putting food on the table. So affordability is a, is a big, big part of the problem, uh, as well as relevancy. You know, we're, we're, I, I think of uh, you know, my upbringing and my access to the internet back in the mid-90s, uh, we had internet in my library. I learned how to use the internet. My parents had internet, we had dial-up in the early 2000s. Uh, so I grew up with the internet. There's whole generations of kids that have very, very little access or exposure to the internet. And so that cycle continues because relevancy continues to be a major issue. It's really hard to know what's on the internet if you've, if you've used it very, very little. Um, so in Detroit, the, the challenges uh, of you know, a major urban area are, are pretty, pretty hard, they're pretty extreme. Um, it's, it's a problem we see in uh, Rust Belt cities and major urban cores all over the country. Detroit just actually ha happens to have one of the largest digital divides uh, anywhere. So it's, it's something that uh, there's gotta be a lot more work done, but it's not just an access problem. There's a lot of other tools in the toolkit that we need to bring to bear to fix this. Okay, great, thank you. Johannes, uh, switching from urban to rural now, where there are problems, as we just heard on that, uh, that small video we played, uh, Michigan State University and the Coelho Center have launched uh, what I think is a groundbreaking study to assess the homework gap in Michigan. And uh, the project's underway right now, so uh, uh, I know we've got three clusters of uh, K through 12 districts that are, are being you know, involved in this study. And uh, the FCC right now lets telecommunication companies sort of self-report on where the access is. And there's a whole bunch of problems with that, and we won't get into that. But your team is really taking a crowdsource and citizen science-based approach going directly to students, uh, and I think 7,000 or so of them, to try to get to the bottom of this problem and measure the impact. So um, the initial study is being done in rural areas. So have you seen anything that uh, would, would provide some indications of causality in rural areas for the lack of broadband access? And do you have any early results you can share with mm -hmm. us from your pilot study? So to the last question, unfortunately not. We are literally, as we speak, collecting uh, data that is coming back uh, from the schools. But we do know from, from earlier work several factors that, that can be mentioned here. One is that, that it's in many ways the same factors that, that explain differences in urban areas and in rural areas, but then there's additional ones in rural areas. Uh, affordability, education uh, are two of the, the same factors that affect urban and rural connectivity. And in fact, uh, th th this imbalance between the best served and the, the worst served in, in urban areas is actually higher than the imbalance between urban areas at large and rural areas. But going to rural areas, one, what is additionally uh, challenging in those areas is the fact that the cost of providing service is much higher. So the unit cost of rolling out networks to sparsely populated areas is way higher than, than in urban areas. Although technology will help us, perhaps uh, you know, satellite solutions that are coming to the market in a few years by, let's say, Elon Musk and others might you know, provide sort of some, some substitute these are technologies that are not necessarily proven, uh, and, and we will have to see it. It probably would be imprudent to wait until those technologies come online. Um, Joe mentioned uh, the, the gap uh, in, in, in official statistics, and I think this is a big problem that we try to address in our, in our, in our studies. There's actually quite a number of, of, of studies ha that have used crowdsourcing methods, so the Microsoft study that you mentioned was one of them. Just to give you the bottom line, for Michigan, that study found that uh, the, uh, the actual usage or the actual broadband availability is about half of what the official statistics suggest it should be. So the FCC data suggests about 90.7% of Michigan households have access to broadband as defined 25 megabits per second or higher, whereas the FCC shows that across the state of Michigan, it's, it's, it's only 47%. Um, the worst county uh, up in the Upper Peninsula, actually, the gap is, is, is of an incredible magnitude. The FCC data shows 75% of that population has access uh, to fast broadband. 
Microsoft better say it's only 7%. Uh, and, and so what we try to do is come up with a way to look at, at um, more granularly at the data uh, by working with school districts. And we currently deploy questionnaires uh, and, and uh, crowdsourced uh, tools uh, to about 200 two classrooms across the state of Michigan, three school districts are involved. And the goal is, goes beyond what any one of the existing studies has been done. Because we have the crowdsourced speed measurement data, we know uh, how the quality of access I is currently organized and, and affects different populations. But we also know from the survey in classroom how it affects students. And this is something that other studies don't know. Uh, we also are able to cover those who do not have access because we capture those in our questionnaire. So for the first time, we'll let you know not only those who are connected <coughs> and how it affects their performance in school, but also those who are not connected and what the hardships is that they encounter. And I can only encourage you to stay tuned. The results will be released uh, in the course of the summer, at least early fall. Yeah, that's really a novel approach. And again, I think Michigan is actually leading the way on this assessment, unlike other states. So in, at least in that regard, we're taking a lead position. So. It's great work, and I know people want to hear about the results in the future. So if we move into a set of questions that kind of describe the, the current uh, state of things and uh, the near-term future, uh, I mentioned the Michigan Broadband Roadmap Report that was produced last year by the uh, MCAN panel, the Michigan Consortium of Advanced Networks, under the 21st Century Infrastructure Commission. <coughs> Quite a mouthful. Um, it sets out a lot of goals, but there's two goals in particular, I think, that are important and uh, kind of bottom line. Uh, the first is that by the year 2022, uh, every resident in business in Michigan will have minimally acceptable broadband speeds as defined by the FCC, 25.3. Uh, Mark is a network operator and constructor of networks. Um, is that goal realistic? Uh, there's another goal that even goes further for 2026 to provide one gigabit access. So, you know, even down the road, there's, there's they're driving us uh, toward uh, more high performance solutions. Are those goals realistic? Uh, how much would it cost to do that in Michigan from your perspective? And, and will technologies like 5G, perhaps wireless that we hear about, actually come in and uh, help save the day? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, the, to start with the cost, I mean, this is billions, if not tens of billions of dollars of capital investment by multiple providers, both wireline and wireless. Uh, what I can share with you in the city of Detroit is that we know to, to build fiber uh, to, to provide one gigabit service, uh, as is the goal by 2026, to, to, to build symmetrical one gigabit fiber to every home in the city of Detroit would be in the order of magnitude of three to four hundred million dollars. Hmm. And, and that's where houses are close together, uh, whereas out in rural areas, as Johannes mentioned, you're talking uh, miles, half miles, quarter miles apart, maybe further. Um, the economics are completely different and completely upside down. So just the city of Detroit alone uh, is a massive undertaking. Um, that's why we gotta have more tools in the toolkit, 5G being one of them. Uh, it's not gonna be the cure-all, but it is a, a very exciting set of technologies that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, if we can deliver uh, last mile internet service for residences in the state of Michigan uh, uh, on 5G networks, that's gonna be a game changer. I mentioned before, one to two uh, options on average per household in this country. Uh, now you can imagine a world where you have three, four, five choices at home. We know free market economics mean lower prices, better service, higher speeds. Um, so 5G's got a lot of promise. Um, I just am, am cautiously optimistic. It's, it's not gonna be here tomorrow at scale. Uh, just like 4G and just like 3G, it's gonna take many, many years and a whole lot of dough mm. to roll out that technology. Great, thank you. Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, uh, another theme that's running through the conference is a priority in Michigan of uh, maintaining leadership role in autonomous and electric vehicles. That requires a robust communication infrastructure, of course, but it also requires an educated workforce uh, uh, to support those kind of developments. So that's one of Michigan's priorities. And uh, we, we talked before the panel about uh, fix the damn roads and the complexity of that. And I'm, I'm really appreciative that uh, the administration is trying to move forward on that. I think it's a, a, a great priority. Uh, my car thanks you, uh, my wheels thank you uh, for that. Um, but when you look at all the priorities in Michigan, where does this priority fit, uh, you know, helping, helping solve the broadband access problem in Michigan? So it, can, it, it continues to be a, a very important part of the infrastructure conversation. It's part of why we're here. And we want to build on some of the momentum that we have seen at the state level as far as interest in extending access 
to everyone in the state of Michigan. There was this report done by MCAN. It is a starting point that is now worth revisiting as we prioritize you know, how we want to approach that, the infrastructure build-out challenge, the affordability challenge, and the digital literacy challenge, um, and understanding that, that, that solutions to that will look different in different parts of the state. The solution in Detroit is different than the solutions in Delta County, for example, in the, in the Upper Peninsula. So we have to be mindful of that. I wanna, uh, the question around the, the state and, and Detroit in particular maintaining its leadership in the mobility space, uh, this is something that is critically important as we seek to have a strong foundation from which to diversify our state's economy. And having strong infrastructure is really, um, will be the bedrock of that diverse economy. When we're talking about new technologies like 5G, they are an important part of that conversation. Um, to be clear, it, I do not view 5G wireless connectivity as a solution to the broad rural, the, the rural internet access problem. I do not think that is a solution that deals with the depth and the quality of coverage rather than the breadth and the expanse of it. So when we're talking about connected infrastructure, we're talking about uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, et cetera, there do need to be deeply like sort of rich connective environments for those vehicles and for those technologies to exist and to thrive in. And so we need to build out, build and deploy that out where it makes sense. And if I can plug something, you know, yesterday we did launch uh, a mobility challenge for a, an autonomous vehicle pathway between Detroit Metro Airport and downtown Detroit for the auto show in June 2020. It would be amazing if there was an infrastructure converse, if infrastructure was part of what the winning bit, uh, bit response to that RFP is in terms of connectivity along that corridor, whether it's up and down 94 or up and down Michigan Avenue and Fort Road coming into downtown Detroit. So we, these all need to be part of the conversation and we're, we're not gonna have some one and done push this button and this problem is gonna be solved. Uh, so we need to really deploy all of our resources, all of the different and, and respective partners have different assets, different expertise, different strength and different experiences and we need to bring all of that to bear. It's one of the reasons why I think a, 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 an updated version of the MCAN experience to create a report and create a map for how the state can move forward will bring that, that new set of stakeholders to the table, that perhaps wider and more diverse set of stakeholders to the table so we can understand the experiences that we're really trying to enable for people um, in cities and in rural areas across the state of Michigan. Fantastic. Johannes, uh, thinking about those MCAN goals, 25-3, uh, you're a leader in research and uh, academics here in Michigan. Does that 25-3 standard, uh, will that be sufficient uh, for Michigan to achieve a leadership position in, in research and education, do you think? In the short term, yes. But broadband connectivity is a moving target. Only a few years ago, in 2011, for example, we thought that three megabits per second download speeds were sufficient to qualify as broadband. Now, eight years later, 25 is considered what we need. And I, I want to say in, in a few years, we probably need to go beyond this. And the reason uh, is the following. There's a virtuous cycle between the network that we have available, the connectivity we have available, and what we can do with the network. Uh, the, in the internet can be seen as what is called a general purpose technology. The better the network is, the more applications, the more services there will be, the more unique ways we will find to provide education to a broader uh, uh, part of the population. The more, the, the more applications there are, the more network quality we need. Right? So it's a, it's a, it's a mutually um, uh, enforcing cycle. If one of them fails, if the network is not good enough, we will also not see those innovations. Mm -hmm. Uh, in education, for example, or in research that would make America more competitive. At the, at the previous session, we heard that uh, Michigan alone has a shortfall of 175,000 college graduates in 2020, plus 125,000 um, uh, no individuals who, who should have an associate degree at least. Mm -hmm. right? At the same time, we have, a, we have a, uh, an oversupply of uh, individuals with only high school education. That, that statistic did not even look at the large number of individuals who need to retrain and requalify to really succeed in the information economy. 
all these problems can be addressed more effectively with internet connectivity because time, um, uh, being able to go to university are probably big constraints. <coughs> and we can use online education in, in more effective ways to bring education to uh, the whole state. So there's a critical dependence on having the, the l right level of connectivity available. I have worked in online classrooms where that had uh, big support, uh, let's say 100 gig of, um, megabits per second or even gigabit uh, connectivity. You can create levels of presence that are very similar to what you experience in a real uh, classroom. And, then, and it's that presence that makes a difference in learning. So I think uh, the more, the better. Mm. That's a great answer. I read something recently where uh, 4G networks uh, came to be in 2010 and it took four years for applications like Snapchat and uh, mobile video to really take root because the network could support it. So I thought that was a really interesting fact. Uh, let's move on here and I do want to try to reserve some time for questions, but we've got one more round for our panel here, looking out into the future a bit more. So um, uh, enhancing broadband access is really a bipartisan issue. Maybe one of the few opportunities we have. and. Um, uh, I'm excited about that. I think the, the different techniques to actually solve the problem may be different, but at least we agree there's a problem. So Mark is a, a network uh, operator in Detroit. I've watched you uh, from afar. Uh, really great success in a short amount of time, and I want to applaud you for that. Um, what was your secret to success in the way of policies, politics, relationships, and other things? And, and what, what could be better? Well, when you think about infrastructure deployment, uh, particularly telecom, uh, the, the, the main challenge is uh, dealing with the right-of-way and who governs the right-of-way, who controls it, and not just the right-of-way, but the infrastructure that already exists in the right-of-way. So for us, I think there's really three key relationships uh, that, that we've been able to build um, that have been very helpful. And the, the first is at the city level. So work with the city of Detroit basically uh, day one. Uh, so we filed permits uh, for building our initial uh, core infrastructure in Detroit. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and the city, you know, frankly, I think hadn't had somebody doing the scale of, of deployment that we were doing downtown in quite some time. Uh, so it was a learning process for both sides. But we were able to come together, uh, work through the existing process, make some tweaks. And, and we've been great partners ever since. So dealing with the city uh, has, been, has been really tremendous and a, a big boost to what we're doing. And I also add that that's in the backdrop. I, uh, I had the privilege of serving on the FCC's Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee for the previous two years and hearing many other service providers from around the country uh, bring numerous, numerous case studies of large municipalities that were the complete opposite of our experience in Detroit. Uh, you know, moratoriums on deployment, six month, 12 month permitting timelines, things that were just unbelievable to hear. Uh, and in many cases, many of these providers ended up abandoning deployments, mm. which only hurts the citizens of that city. So uh, city of Detroit's been a great partner. Second one is the state of Michigan. The state of Michigan has actually one of the best uh, legal and regulatory frameworks for telecom deployment in the country. Uh, and that's been our history for a long time. So starting with the, the Metro Act, which governs underground utility construction in the state of Michigan, creates a very standard t uh, timing and cost framework for building underground infrastructure. Uh, you've got the Uniform Franchise Act, uh, which streamlines uh, a, a lot of stuff on, on the video side, but also covers infrastructure. And then this past fall, we passed the, uh, the small cell uh, uh, Senate Bill 637, which was a bit controversial in terms of some of the things that are in there, including the rates and fees paid to municipalities. But what it did was create a uniform framework for small cell deployment, which is the critical technology behind 5G. So state of Michigan, another uh, you know, really great partner and great example of what we can do when we focus on telecom investment. Uh, the last one I would say is, is uh, utility company. So in Southeast Michigan, our primary owner uh, and controller of, of most of the utility poles is DTE, DTE Energy. So DTE um, is, uh, falls under the purview of the MPSC, and the state of Michigan is one of the, the, the few states that actually governs uh, poles. The FCC actually does uh, poll regulation across the country, except for states that opt out. Michigan's one of the states that opts out. And there's some things in there that, that we're missing, like an actual shot clock for pull attachments. That's not really a thing in the state of Michigan. Uh, so DTE, being a great partner and a willing participant, helped us very early on get on their pulls, do make ready, walk us through that process so our deployment timelines weren't like those stories we, we heard on DDAC of 6, 12, 18 months in some cases. So well, those would be the, the three key relationships and, and things that we've been able to accomplish. So we're recording this. We're going to refer to these uh, suggestions later, right? There we sure. go. 
Uh, Johannes, working for one of the great uh, research universities in Michigan, um, you have a global perspective, and you talked a little bit about that at the, uh, the onset of the conversation. Are there other examples in uh, you know, international locales that could help to inform Michigan or the United States? Mm -hmm. so, so it is easy, actually, to get um, antsy about other countries being better than the United States. Uh, and, and it's not easy to really compare internationally. For example, a place like Singapore, which is a small city state, or a country like Korea, which has 10 times the population density as the United States, or, or, or some European countries like Switzerland that are very small and very rich, um, they have been successful in, in, in enforcing policies and, and putting frameworks into place that allow competition and, and yield high, high quality services. But the U.S. is different in many ways. The U.S. is vast. The average population density in the United States is relatively low. The population is very dispersed and not just concentrated in some areas. So one has to really focus on, on solutions that work in this, in this country. So copying doesn't work, but emulating perhaps uh, some of the successful things might work. The one thing in my experience uh, working in many other places that is different is, is that there is a stronger sense outside of the United States that government and private businesses and entrepreneurs need to complement each other. They're not at odds, but they really need to work together to achieve solutions. And I'm really encouraged by the sentiment of this conference where collaboration, working across silos, working across uh, partisan divides was very, very strongly emphasized. And I think that's where the solutions are. There has to be the right framework for entrepreneurs to succeed and provide high quality services. At the same time, there needs to be uh, programs of subsidies, perhaps models that work in other countries very well are reverse auctions where, where the, the, the right or the duty to serve remote areas is actually auctioned off to the lowest bidder rather than the highest bidder. All these are models that have worked and I think would also lend itself for themselves um, for the United States to, to close that gap. Great, thank you. Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, I'd like to give you the last word uh, on this. So uh, being a, a senior leader in the executive branch of state government, uh, what common ground do you see? What, what early opportunities might there be to help unite us in moving forward with broadband enhancements in the state? Well, very quickly, um, the time that I've spent with every member of the state Senate has, there's been really broad an interest in internet connectivity and making sure that broadband was available to everyone in the state of Michigan. So there is an opportunity to have this conversation. And so I think by embarking upon a process that brings a new set of stakeholders to the table to update the, the state of Michigan's plan and vision for, for connectivity in the state of Michigan, I think is a good first step. In terms of low-hanging fruit, I think we need to deal with this question of, of digital literacy. I think that's the easiest one. It's the least, the least expensive uh, for all stakeholders to address to thinking about what kinds of uh, strategies, approaches, curriculums, community engagement, what that would look like to really um, change people's relationship with the connectivity that they have to actually help them and empower them to be evangelists to those who may not yet have it to understand how they can benefit from it. That is fantastic. Last word. Lieutenant Governor, thank you. We've got a ton of questions here, and we've got about five and a half minutes or so left, so we'll do our best. And I'm sure some of the panelists may be willing to stay a little longer and uh, answer some of these questions or attempt to answer some of the questions. So uh, the first one, is there a public policy solution to get Michi Michigan connected? And there's a new hashtag that's starting. It's called Fund the Damn Internet here. So this is what this person has suggested. So any public policy solutions to helping here? Our budget's a great start. Two and a half billion dollars every year for rep, for uh, new revenue for infrastructure creation, um, which a lot of that will include opening up right of ways all across the state of Michigan to actually fix them. And doing that exposes a really important opportunity to lay conduit for connectivity to every community in the state of Michigan. So that would be a great public policy solution to that problem. That's fantastic. Others, any any other views? So I think the the work that we're actually doing might help um, come up with more granular solutions. It, it would be very expensive to provide gigabit connectivity to everybody across Michigan. So that's a $5 billion proposition, most likely. Uh, and you know that, that doubles the amount of uh, marijuana anybody would have to smoke in Michigan if you want to fund it based on the, <laughs> on the pot tax, right? But maybe in, in an intermediate stage, not everybody needs to have gigabit connectivity. Communities could actually create community centers that are workplaces uh, that are sort of deliberately designed to provide access points other than having to sit in the cold parking lot outside of a library. Uh, we, could, we could envision um, um, 
providing, uh, for example, a combination of wireless and wireline solutions, the, the fixed wireless solution that, uh, that uh, Mark mentioned might be a solution. So there's, there's, there's intermediate steps, I think, that one can undertake. And then I, I also would like to echo that digital literacy is an important component. So it's the infrastructure is only part of it, right? What we can do with it, how we can use it, how we can appreciate its services is another one. Great, Mark? Uh, you know, I think it's something you could say, throwing money at it to solve the problem. We know that's not the reality, but one key piece I want to call out that right now, all of our schools and libraries uh, have access to what's called E-rate funding. So it's a federally administered program, very, very important program that provides a, a, a sliding scale of reimbursement for internet services based on a, uh, a, a need basis. Uh, so the lower the household income in a certain given uh, census tract, the more E-rate funding you'll get, up to a 90% reimbursement in the most at-need areas. Uh, E-rate is a wonderful program but it needs to be expanded in my opinion. I think you know we're, we're taking care of uh, connectivity in schools and libraries and not looking at the fact that as soon as those kids go home, they're offline or they're underserved. And so if we're gonna truly uh, you know, make that investment, we gotta solve the after school uh, uh, issue that we have right now. Boy, I totally agree with you on E-rate. We're working in the educational ecosystem. It breaks my heart to see that these investments aren't always able to be leveraged for other purposes as well. So I think that's a great idea and uh, somebody should take note of that. Oh, we've got a question here. What are feasible ways for individuals to become uh, more involved with helping solve the connectivity gap? We heard from uh, John Kasich today about uh, individualism and you know uh, uh, taking action. And somebody's asking, how can individuals help here? Who would like to start there? I think any community needs an advocate uh, for improving connectivity. Somebody who can can pull uh, different stakeholders together, and, and maybe that's depending on who that individual is and what, what the individual skills and capabilities are that might be a fantastic role to play. There's also one of the solutions I think is in public-private partnership. In, in those areas that are not supported by market forces and competition because the cost perhaps might be too high. So here we have to make sure that the cost of obtaining rights of way are as low as possible. Community, private sector partnerships can help really reduce the cost and provide service at, a, at an affordable rate. Anyone th else? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that is well and good for someone who is able to take individual action. I think this is a collective problem. Um, I, think that the, I think that we need to think about uh, community action to deal with these community challenges. Um, I think if we frame the challenge of internet access as an individual problem, we will not get a big enough solution for it. You know, for me, I think it's advocacy. I think um, for a long time, it's, it's been unrecognized just how important the internet is uh, to the economic development, to the education of the citizens uh, of a city. And so you're just now starting to see cities hire uh, persons or roles that are dedicated toward advancing internet access in their, in their locale. So, you know, if I'm a private citizen, I'm, I'm hitting up my, uh, my local leaders and I'm saying this is something we should be investing in. Uh, we should be taking tax dollars generated off the telecom industry and we should be earmarking them for reinvestment in our, our, in our communities uh, for connectivity needs. Um, and I would just be getting engaged with local government. That's fantastic. We are really short on time. We're 25 seconds uh, from the end. So great job, panelists, for uh, timing all this. I'd like everyone to give a big round of applause to these folks. They are expert in what they do. And more than anything, they all care. They all care about this problem. And I've uh, really uh, come to know that uh, over the last few months. So thank you for all you do. And uh, thanks for being a member of the panel. I'm honored. So thank, thank you. you. And we may stick around. I see there's beer and wine. Uh, mm -hmm. Might uh, loosen the tongue for answering some questions here. So here we go. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for attending and sticking it out the whole day. Appreciate it.